Uh, today, we're covering three topics. One is avoiding rejection, and there is some duplication with what I told you yesterday. Then, the second short presentation is um, on uh, a questionnaire about conflict of interest that I carried out a couple of uh, last year, year before. And the last part, actually, you were given the answers also, is common mistakes, 50 common mistakes. So let's get started with avoiding rejection. And as we said yesterday, the titles should be um, uh, as short and terse as possible. So this looks shorter than this, but this is not good because of two reasons. One reason is that there are abbreviations in the title. In the main title, you should not have abbreviations. Okay, everybody here knows CT is computed tomography. But you will never see that in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's always computed tomography. One reason is if you go to Stedman's Dictionary of Medical Abbreviations and look up CT, there are 36 meanings. Cardiothoracic, etc., etc. So in the main title, there should not be these uh, abbreviations. You can put them in the running title because the running title usually has a maximum of 40 or 50 characters. So you can use it, you can use these in the running title. The other reason, the second reason is what are you comparing? In this title, you're comparing CT and High resolution CT, okay. But the real meaning is you are comparing the machines. Are you engineers? No. What you're doing is you're comparing the radiological characteristics. So comparison of the characteristics of small peripheral nodules on computed tomography and high resolution computed tomography. Now, after a hyphen, you have a lowercase letter. Again, as I said yesterday, there are the recommendations of the ICMJE, but you should also look at your target journal. If your target journal uses capital letters, uppercase letters for these kinds of nouns, then you use capital letters. Increasing numbers of journals are using uppercase letter for the first letter only, and the rest all lowercase. Again, a very small point. It doesn't change the meaning, but it does tell the reviewer if you are looking at their journal or not. Are you a reader? If you're not a reader, there's automatically a slightly hmm, distance felt, a slightly negative impression is given. Now here we have, I think, as I said yesterday, you do not need research on or studies on. If it's not research, you're not publishing. So again, Without the abbreviation, fibronectin and the gene expression of interleukin-2. 
Now, everybody would understand this, but this is more correct. And it's not, even though you're spelling it out, it is not so much longer. Again, look, this is a, a pretty bad title. You have um, uh, six lines. It's more like a small paragraph than a title. Genetic aspects of immunoglobulin, heavy chain, gene rearrangement, and how you get tired. And there's also this colon for a, a, a subtitle. Most journals do not like subtitles. Now, 30 years ago, 40, 50 years ago, that was OK. But today, put it in one title is the main philosophy. So we get molecular biologic aspects of mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue lymphoma. And this, that more or less covers this area. OK, there are many mistakes here. First of all, you should spell out the full name, not just initials. And this is especially the case in Korea, where you have uh, a fairly limited number of family names. So it's not enough just to give initials, give the full name and the highest academic degree. Now, this DMED SC, many Japanese doctors, clinicians, they also write a thesis. But it is not usually basic research. So in my mind, it is not really a PhD in the real sense. So, for clinicians who have done an extra degree, I encourage them to do DMED as the Doctor of Medical Science. And when you see MD followed by another degree, you know, aha, this is some other degree on top of the MD. You may not be sure exactly what, but you know it is something extra. And this is also a very kind of common mistake where the first author spells out his first name and family name. These are all capitals, capital, lowercase. These are all uppercase. And this is the Japanese she. And normally, you write S-H-I, right? But sometimes people misspell the names of their colleagues. Now, if their colleague wants to be, um, wants to spell their name like this, that's fine. But you have to spell out the full name and have a space, OK? And also, for example, in Korea, also you have perhaps different spellings of the same name. For example, Lee could be L-E-E -E or L-E-A, or um, the president of Korea in the 1950s, uh, Ri Singman, is his name was spelled R-H-E-E. -E. So to a foreigner, R-H-E-E -E is very different from L-E-E -E or L-E-A. So if that is how he wants to spell his name or her name, OK. But you, you cannot change the spelling of somebody's name the way you want it. And rather than just one asterisk, two asterisks, or three asterisks, you should use 
the International Committee of Medical, of Medical Journal Editors have a series <coughs> of symbols they use. Now, this is a very small point, but one, two, three, takes up this much space. This takes up the same space as this. So especially in a paper journal, you want to limit space. It's a small point, but you have to use the method of indication used by your target journals. As I said yesterday, there is increasing emphasis on respecting and following the instructions to authors of your target journal. And you do not need abbreviations. It's, uh, it does not help understanding. And here there is no address, so you should write out in full, like this. And again, this is a common mistake, no, no space or a small letter here or lowercase, small p here. Be sure that, remember, the title page is the face of your journal, of your paper. And if you have made a mistake here with spacing or lowercase letter, the initial impression is not good. Now, some journals, especially in the 1990s and early 2000s, tried to uh, hide the title page from the reviewers in order to get a more uh, objective review. But now they have mainly stopped. I think only about 10, 15% of journals remove the title page because usually in the field you can tell what group, what, what institution they came from, especially in the discussion. In our previous report, reference 31, 31. Oh, okay, yeah. Right, no point. So the title page is usually seen, it's the first thing the, the um, reviewer sees, so it should be treated carefully. Now, as I said, running titles, FN, IL2, that's fine. But even here, you can spell out and you're even within the 40 characters limit. But if you want, you can use IL2 and FN or CT, HRCT for the running title, the, sh the short title. Okay, so here you have a bad title page. This is slightly adapted, but there are so many mistakes here. Um, full name, no full name, no full name, no full name. Uh, no space, no space, no space, no space, no space, no space, no space. Abbreviations unnecessary. Author for corresponding, no name, just an address. This is, this is taken from an actual paper I was sent, and it's terrible. And if a reviewer gets a title page like this, the initial reaction will be very strongly negative. So if you want to be rejected, this is how you write. <laughs> so rather than that, you would, and divided this into two sections, um, so there's a computer tomography and high resolution computer tomography spelled out, the names, spacing correct, uh, one asterisk, one dagger, dagger here, asterisk here. For the first affiliation, usually you do not need an indicating mark. So it is assumed 
that this person belongs to this department. If the person belongs to two different departments, then you have to use uh, identifying marks. And then you give the corresponding author with the name, not Mr. Anonymous, and the full address, not just this, these two lines, and the fax and the email. And uh, yesterday, I talked about disclaimers, limiting responsibility. For example, we are not responsible for the safety of this procedure, or no reprint of this paper will be available. Uh, today, reprints are very uncommon anyway, but uh, then you have the short title. Single spacing is used only for letters. For the rest of your paper, from the beginning of the title page to the end of the references, end of the le figure legends, everything should be double spaced. And the origin of this was so that the reviewer could write between 1.5 is not enough, double spacing. Here you have enough room to write changes if you want to edit. And almost no paper goes without editing. And the New England Journal of Medicine used to specify triple spacing rather than double spacing. The New England Journal of Medicine, they have their own very large group of editors. And they are very, uh, they are very demanding. The first paper I edited that was accepted by the New England Journal of Medicine. Oh, very happy about that. Um, we sent it, came back for uh, with some review comments, not so serious, wonderful. We revised it, sent it back, accepted. Oh, great. Then about six weeks, to two months later, we get a letter saying, for the final revision, we need to talk to you by telephone, not email. And we have made some questions. There are over 50 questions about the accepted manuscript, mainly about references. The year, the was were the, all the authors listed, etc. But uh, also, for example, the New England Journal of Medicine used to write 25 space P-E-R space C-E-N-T. And then it changed to 25 space P-E-R-C-E-N-T, one word. So we wrote that, but recently, they had changed to 25% symbol in the last year. So it's important you look at the recent version of your target journal. So I, I was talking with the uh, editor at the New England Journal, and she was saying, yes, we just changed to the percent mark. Don't you think that's better? I said, oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, but it is, it's, and this is triple spacing. And this is just an example of an unstructured abstract. And most journals, the New England Journal of Medicine uh, changed to structured abstract about 10, 15 years ago. And since then, many other journals have followed the New England Journal and they prefer a structured abstract because it is easier to understand the science. Okay, so here you have the objective, 
Okay, you know what the objective is. The methodology, the results, and the conclusion. This is much easier to understand, okay, and quicker to read. However, the fastest way to understand a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine is to read four sentences. First sentence of the introduction. Last sentence of the introduction. First sentence of the discussion. Last sentence of the discussion. With those four sentences, you have the general background, purpose, and results of the paper. And it's shorter than the abstract. So if you want to read it really fast, and you don't have time, those are the four sentences to look at. And as I said yesterday, the basic style used by almost all journals is the IMRAD style, introductions, materials, results, and discussion. But of course, if you have a review article, letter to the editor, rapid communication, short communication, there may be different formats. And unlike most original research papers, letters to the editor, rapid communications, short communications, these are an all or none proposition. You get accepted or rejected. No comments. No chance to come back. They don't have time. So it is essential, especially essential, that you follow the format for the letters, the rapid communications, and the short communications. Because if you don't follow the format, like yesterday I said, editorial boards spend a lot of time deciding on exactly how they want manuscripts to be sent. This is especially the case for letters, rhetoric communications, or short communications. So if you don't follow that, you're out. They will, will not give you a second chance. OK. Um, here you have synthesized with a random primer, Gibco. Gibco, Grand Island, New York. Or, as I said yesterday, if you're submitting to a European journal, probably New York, USA might be better. Again, look at the journal and see if they use USA after the, the state name. And usually, after you in, introduce the place of the company, you don't need to do it again. But some companies are based in different countries, like Dacol or Gibco also. And in that case, you may have to give Dacol Copenhagen or um, Rostro, uh, Castro, uh, Denmark, or their bases in the US and I think in Asia too. If the material you obtained is from those places, you have to give those addresses in addition. And just uh, Korea or Japan is not enough. You have to say where. And again, written informed consent. 25 years ago, informed consent was in enough. And that was spoken. Yes, we obtained informed consent. Prove it. Uh, we, 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 we don't have anything written down. But please believe me, the, the patient did say yes. Well, that can be, will you join this study? I mean, it can be done very nicely or almost threateningly. There are different ways. So the ICMJ insists on having written informed consent before the start of the study 
and it was approved by the Committee on Ethical Human Research. And if you can give a research study number from your um, institution and also a statement that is, it is in agreement with the Helsinki Declaration. Uh, and this is for, uh, again, human beings, fully informed consent was taken from all subjects in writing, and the study was formed. Our animals were treated in accordance with the guidelines of our institutional committee on the treatment of experimental animals. And especially in Europe and North America, they're becoming very uh, uh, demanding about this. Uh, at Tokyo Medical University, we had the first, um, the first successful lung cancer model in dogs. But we could not show the dogs to visiting scientists. The dogs were in the room next to me. Th that was not the problem, that they were next to me. <laughs> uh, the problem was they were in cages, not very well kept. And um, when we took them out every week for uh, the in injection of the carcinogen, uh, they would not get fed in the morning because of the anesthesia. And so they knew they were going to get drunk. So all morning, I couldn't, I couldn't work. They were making so much noise. And then they would be injected and with the anesthesia and then the carcinogen, and they would go to sleep. And they were not allowed to sleep in the cage. They were brought into my room. <laughs> when I say my room, my room, and my room is about from here to here to there with uh, 10 people. And the dogs are <laughs> lying on the floor. And uh, as they begin to wake up, they're walking. I mean, they're drunk. And it's funny but sad. But we could not show these two outside investigators because um, it wasn't really in, in accordance with any uh, guideline. We didn't have any guidelines on treatment of experimental animals at that time. This is 1975, 76, 77. So th at that time, there were no guidelines for animals. Um, now, this is not so much a problem anymore, but it used to be many um, investigators would indicate the case, n not just the number, but the initials. And of course, this is private information, and you should never use initials, even false initials at all. Yesterday, I mentioned that selected is a word that you're better to avoid. So instead of, um, we selected 85 patients with a history of exposure to asbestos and smoking. A total of 125 consecutively seen patients. So we did not just pick the suitable ones. The all consecutively seen patients that satisfied the eligibility criteria. What are the eligibility of criteria? One, exposure, sorry, um, exposure to asbestos and smoking, were invited to participate and 85 agree. So from that, you can see it is a very objective inclusion system, enrollment system, whereas Maybe this is exactly the same. The person who wrote this actually means this. But as soon as a reviewer says, we sees, we selected, they think, hmm, how did they select? What were the criteria? That's the immediate question. What were the selection criteria? 
And therefore, we hope this report will make a significant contribution, a significant, has a very specific statistical sense, right? That's P less than 0 0.05. So try to avoid statistical terms unless you are using them in a statistical meaning. So in this case, you would change it to, we hope this report will make a meaningful contribution. And OK, to you, it's a significant decrease. But to me, the reviewer or the reader, I don't know, what do you mean by significant? 2%? 50%? So it's better to be uh, more definite, resulting in a 25% decrease in the size of the lesion. Substantial decrease, again, this is a, it's sort of acceptable, but uh, it's not, I would not recommend it. I would say 25% or greater decrease. And, okay, the, the discussion begins, okay? Recently, HTRT, the catalytic subunit of telomerase, has been cloned. 10, 11, now, this is the beginning of a discussion, right? And you're saying da, 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 10, 11. That is probably what somebody else did. I don't care about what somebody else did. What did you do in your paper? Why must I decide to accept your paper? So at the beginning of this, the discussion, as I told you, the reviewer is tired. You have to reset their mind, OK? And they go on. The expression of high levels of HTRT has been observed in telomerase positive cell lines, but not in telomerase negative cell lines, 10 and 11, saying the expression of HTRT mRNA is detected. Blah, blah, blah. Now, this was written by a very well known member of TMU. He's chairman of the department. He's published hundreds of um, papers, but this is not the way to begin a discussion. OK, what, what, do you, what is this about? Looking at this, what do you think he's talking about? We set out to determine whether the detection of HRT MRI in biopsy specimens and bile would have diagnostic value for biliary tract cancers. He's talking about biliary tract cancers. There's nothing about biliary tract cancers here. Whereas here, you know what he's saying. And then recently, da, 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 da. that's OK. But you have to know where you're going. I mean, would you get on a bus that has no destination? No. You don't want to get on. You would, be, you would be worried about where you're going. And also, in the discussion, it helps the reader, it helps the reviewer to understand where you're going. And regarding this, these are the kind of, um, this is a Japanese, uh, or Ch Chinese meaning uh, real sound, they, what they really mean. These are. These are private comments to the editor from the reviewer. They do not go, these do not go to, uh, these, these do not go to the author. These are private comments that are sent to the editor in, in chief and you could, it's well designed study, but it's unclear what new information is being presented. This paper does not present any substantially new information. I'm not able to understand the value. You have no hope of being accepted in a decent journal if the reviewer cannot see what is the new information and the value of the paper. You have to appeal. You have to sell yourself. You have to sell your paper. 
Why is it so good? What's different about it from the already existing literature? Again, uh, when you're doing the references, if you give your references in alphabetical when it should be by um, in the order in which they appear, again, you will be you will give the reviewer a very negative image. And also, if you if the journal is using alphabetical uh, order and you do not use it. It doesn't matter what the ICMJE recommends. I would give precedence to the instructions to others. Right? This is non-alphabetical. OK, now the covering letter used to be very simple. OK, now one, this is a very common mistake in Japan. I don't know about Korea, but this is Jay Block. He used to be the editor-in-chief of CHEST. Dear Dr. J. Block, you, you do not say that. Either if you know the person directly, dear J. Or if you don't know him, dear Dr. Block. Even though here you write J. Block, here you do not write J. Block. It's either Dr. Block or J. So you don't write to me, dear Patrick Barron. It's either dear Patrick or dear Professor Barron, whichever you want to use. But this is strange. It's a combination of informal and formal. And the covering letter used to be very simple. Again, on www.rombun.jp, there are examples of many kinds of covering letters in English. And the covering letter today is much more important than it used to be. In fact, I recommend putting one paragraph in the covering letter that is basically a mini abstract. There are two main reasons for this. One is. The editor-in-chief or the, edit, the office manager can see if this is a new idea, a new concept, something valuable. Secondly, it helps the editor-in-chief select reviewers. Remember, the editor-in-chief is not God, and each journal usually covers quite a wide area. So it helps. Every, everything you can do to help the editor and the reviewers is worth it. So dear Dr. Block, that's OK. And concerning copyright, you say that we've signed the assignment document. It's not been previously published, nor is it under consideration by any other publication. Well, that's fairly common sense. Now, <clears throat> how to suggest possible referees. How many people here have submitted a paper to an English language journal? Could you raise your hand if you've submitted uh, quite a few. Okay, how many of you suggested referees? One, two, three, four. This is very important. It can make a huge difference. Now, there are several reasons. This is actually a letter I wrote uh, 31 years ago, 1982. Uh, this is my mentor, Yoshihiro Hayata. And he suggested Dr. Cortese and Dr. Edel of the Mayo Clinic. At that time, Dr. Cortese was a very junior doctor. He was about 37. Later, he became CEO of the entire Mayo Clinic. 
we, we were not to know that at that time. But um, at that time, these people were very young, and P Dr. Patrice also was not 40. When you suggest referees, do not suggest someone on the editorial board. Why? Because they're too busy. They won't do it. It really, it's, I mean, they'd like to, but they, they just are too busy. And that's why international congresses and developing a, your own network is very important. Because if even one, re, one reviewer can, can understand what your work is and what you're trying to do, that can make the difference between being accepted and not. Now, I, sh I showed this slide to Dr. Uh, Richard Irwin, who is the editor-in-chief of CHEST. And in addition to the reasons I gave, he also told me, you know, he said, we get between three and 4,000 papers a year. To get two reviewers for a paper, I usually have to ask three people, because one will say, I'm sorry, I'm busy. So that's three times three, 4,000. That's 9,000 to 12,000 people a year he must write to ask to review papers. Does he know 12,000 people in different fields? No. And he said, so it's a great help if people will give me some names that I can choose from. So the level of a journal is decided by the level of the review. I'm pretty sure that many of you, if you are asked to do a review in Korean for a Korean language journal, mm, okay, okay, I'll do it. And you, but if you are asked by the New England Journal of Medicine to review a paper, whoa, <laughs> whoa. I cannot make a mistake about this one, right? It's a great honor. So you want, if you're the editor-in-chief of a journal, you want a lot of good editors. Because if I have one guy, if it's asthma, I always ask this guy. Or every second paper. And I keep asking him. And finally, he writes back and says, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm really busy. I'd, I'd like to do it, but I'm Give me a break uh, for six months. And I've lost a good reviewer. So I am always looking for new good reviewers. So if somebody suggests somebody else, OK, I don't know him, but I'll ask him for, to do a review. And then I'll carefully look at his first review. And if his review is, oh, great paper, except. I'll never ask him again. But if he writes a good review, objective, helping the author, OK. I'll ask him again for, this, for papers in this field. I've, I've gained my, my assets have increased by one reviewer. And that's why it's And also, you are able to say to the editor-in-chief if there is somebody you do not want to be a reviewer. But in that case, you must give a reason. We would appreciate it if you do not uh, ask Professor Barron or his associates at Tokyo Medical University to review this paper because in the past, we have had many basic disagreements at international meetings, and we do not feel that Professor Barron could make a sufficiently objective evaluation. So the editor-in-chief will think, OK, I want an objective evaluation. If the author says that this guy Barron is too emotional, he won't give an objective uh, review. We leave them out, go to somebody else. So if 
there's one person who says no, and one person says, well, maybe. Very often, the, jur the journal will say, well, OK. They will send the comments of the negative reviewer and the comments of the maybe guy to you. Or they might send it to another two referees. Again, they might select one from the people that you mentioned. And just because you know them does not mean that they're going to be nice to you. They can be very strict about size. I mean, when, when you're meeting, having a drink, or at a social occasion, very nice. But when it comes to reviewing, they can be very uh, demanding. But it does help the editor. And usually, if you know the person, and the person has seen your presentations, posters, or oral, you've discussed it over so social events, he knows what you're trying to do. He knows the problems that you're trying to overcome. Maybe he is or she is doing something similar. And they are facing the same kind of problems. And so they are sympathetic to your problems. Otherwise, the editor-in-chief may have to just pick a name out of a hat. And sometimes those reviewers uh, are they, they write reviews that are very strange. It can be. So um, these were people with whom we competed with very strong competition, especially in the field of uh, photodynamic therapy, which is uh, Professor Jeon is doing quite a bit of here at um, Pundang Hospital. And uh, but it's good competition. We recognize each other's flaws and, and good points. And this is an example from uh, clinical endocrinology of the author's declaration. And if you look at various journals, you'll find various types of documents, copyright, endorsement, COI, etc. And I would suggest that you download some of these and keep them in hand, COI, declaration documents, uh, copyright, exam, uh, copyright declaration, etc. Uh, and as I said yesterday, keep these until after you retire. For the New England Journal, they say, less than 2,500 words in the manuscript, abstract less than 250 words of our repetition, and keep the introduction and discussion as short as possible. Um, very often, your manuscript may be less than 2,500 words when you submit it. But with the comments that you get, you have to add and it gets beyond 2,500 words. But that's OK, because you're doing that in response to the needs of the journal. If you start off with 2,700 words, no good. So the initial submission must be in agreement with the instructions to authors. And you have to indicate um, if the study protocol was reviewed and approved by an institutional review, review board, and if all study subjects gave informed consent. Well, this is now common knowledge. And also in the cover letter, you have to disclose any potential conflicts of interest and any financial arrangements especially with a company whose product or products figure prominently in the submitted manuscript, or with a company making a competing product, just like I mentioned yesterday. I'll show you some examples later. If there are no conflicts, they should be stated explicitly. And in the acknowledgments, 
They're indebted to A&B for the review of the manuscript, express their gratitude for their excellent technical and secretarial contributions, respectively. So I, I suggest that if you have a secretary type up your uh, submission, that you should mention that person's name. And like I said yesterday, if somebody got the money but didn't do the work, their name goes in the acknowledgement. Important input concerning statistical analysis was also provided by E, and Professor F also provided important guidance. That could be for your chairman of your department. Now, conflict of interest, I'll do a little bit in more detail later, but as I said yesterday, there's a difference in uh, Asia and the West, and the mistake in the sea area can really seriously damage your reputation. And conflict of interest, what is it? Well, if you're in a position to benefit financially or otherwise from the contents of the report, that is conflict of interest. Or your family. And if you have any doubt, consult the editor-in-chief at submission or before submission. And like I told you, um, the American Journal of uh, Investigative Ophthalmology uh, are very careful because there's a lot of money involved in ophthalmological equipment. And so the um, rewards for academic success can be very strong sources of bias. So the audience should be aware if any such interests do exist. And if any single author has a financial interest, the financial interest applies to the publication as a whole. Even if only one author has a conflict of interest, that must be clearly stated. Okay, so here you have financial interest in process or product, present capital P. Potential competing equipment, C is for competing, PC. So this is if you get benefit from the manufacturer of the equipment used in, in your paper, or if you have an interest in a competing product. I, I see again competing. But you get the idea. It's uh, employee and employee of a potentially competing country. So, Again, yesterday there was a question, how about if, the, if one of the authors is an employee of the company and they say that there is no conflict of interest? And as I said, that's impossible. There, there must be conflict of interest. Unless the guy is working for free, no salary, then maybe okay. <laughs> but uh, that is very unusual. And examples of con con uh, compensation, retainers, contract payments, consulting fees, non-monetary perquisites like picking up at the airport or hotel con uh, accommodation, con contribution to research or research funds, travel funds, travel expenses. It's, it's serious business. And these are the symbols given by the ICMJE to, for identifying marks. You've got the asterisk, the dagger, double dagger, the double S, the parallel lines. And, no, it's not ampersand, but you get the idea. It's to keep the space as narrow as possible. So any questions?